morning, everybody. So I am going to describe some of our strategies for mapping the archaeological landscapes of the Tigris Valley in the Kurdistan Autonomous Region of northern Iraq. We're using a combination of uh, multispectral satellite data, um, some panchromatic and multispectral images from, uh, taken from, collected by the UAVs, and we're bringing it together with field walking results, um, basically to map all kinds of different archaeological landscapes in this area. And so we've had five, five years of survey under our belt now, um, mostly conducted by my uh, good colleague, Paula Sconzo, who, is, who runs the, the field collection. And in the beginning, the focus was mapping key archaeological sites, key landscape features um, you know, that, that are very prominent um, on the landscape. And as we progress, we become more and more interested in what's between these key sites, much like Elisa stressed here, um, off-site type survey. Um, and it's the, as Gail pointed out, the, the, the line between what is a site and what is off-site is, is quite blurry, and, and we'll see that here. So I refer to them here as continuous. Um, so I'll present here a portion of the 2017 UAV survey carried out by the famous uh, Matthias Lang of one of the organizers, and he recorded about 17 square kilometers of uh, uh, imagery. Um, I'll just show you a little piece of it here. And then I'll also show you how some of the Worldview 2 multispectral images from Digital Globe um, can contribute to the archaeological survey in terms of guiding what we do and interpreting what we see um, as we map archaeological features and settlement over the survey area. So I'll give you a little introduction to the project. Um, so it's, um, I'll call it the EHAS, the Eastern Habor Archaeological Survey. It's directed by Peter Feltzner here at Tübingen. Um, it's a regional survey and it had two initial goals. First, and most obviously, is to document the archaeological landscapes of what is basically an unexplored region um, up until five years ago. It covers about 4,500 square kilometers. And you can see a range of environments from marshes flanking the, the eastern Habor and Tiger. Wow. I saw you guys doing this before, and I swore it wouldn't happen to me, but there we go. Um, is this a? Yes. Marshes flanking the Habor and Tigris rivers down deep in the valleys, um, up to the mountain peaks that are along the border with, um, with Turkey. And second, one of the second initial goals of the Eastern Habor Archaeological Survey is to understand patterns of settlement and change in this region, um, specifically for the third and second millennia BC. Uh, we're expanding beyond that um, definitely in this paper. Of particular interest has been this, what, what's labeled here as Area B. It's the eastern side of the Tigris Valley. It's a rolling landscape that ascends towards the uh, Saks e Bisher range here, the, the, the kind of the front range of the Zagros. Um, and it's of interest because it really is kind of a very rich archaeological landscape. It's got the majority of what you would consider a true tell in this survey region. Um, and it also contains uh, Basetki, which is kind of the focus um, here, um, which is, you know, one of the like, it is the major um, archaeological site, mostly third and second millennium um, here in the region. It's also now the um, site for the Kugamid uh, excursion, the Kugamid exp expedition, which is the Kurdish-German archaeological mission in Duhok, also directed by Peter Feltzner. So what I'm going to, I'm going to just flip through these slides here really quick. What we see here in red are the areas that Paolo Sconzo has covered with her uh, pedestrian survey. Um, you can see it's a considerable amount of uh, land considering how really large the whole survey area is. And you can notice that the focus of survey has been in areas uh, A, B, and C. These are quite inaccessible and politically sensitive at the moment. Let's see, how are we doing? Just to zoom in on uh, area B and to highlight the um, ratio of archaeological sites to survey coverage um, in this area. And you might notice um, that most of the survey to date, like I um, briefly mentioned, is radiating out from uh, Basetki 
in the interest of collecting off-site cervix connected to a major center, and the Mukablik cluster, which also is um, a cluster of sites that are uh, kind of represent a continuum of settlement in that region. You can see sites kind of cluster on these uh, drainages centered on springs, um, which I won't go too much into. And um, there's a couple holes in the survey uh, yet, which will be filled in. Let's go over the field methods. Like I mentioned, field walking um, is being carried out and it fits the, what is, what we're, I guess the way it's being organized is by uh, agricultural field, modern agricultural field, um, kind of lay out a ready-made grid type thing. Um, they, in the beginning of the survey, um, field survey uh, followed, um, followed what we, what, we just, what we were able to identify on satellite imagery. Um, from an online client like Google, Google Earth or something like that, serving worldview imagery, and also relying heavily on the Corona Atlas of the Middle East um, from uh, Jesse Kasana and Jack Cothran, and the satellite imagery um, that we got from the Digital Globe Foundation, which I'll show a little bit later. There's surface inspection, landscape description, which each of, in each of these field tracks, lots of sketch mapping, of course, um, your... your um, normal and responsible roster of, you know, archaeological field methods. And then, like most surveys now, we integrate um, the, some commercial drones to collect uh, topo data, land cover data for um, key archaeological sites. And today we've uh, covered about 106 arche individual archaeological sites over the first three seasons. Um, not including the landscape scale survey that I'm going to present here in a little bit. But what I'm going to talk about right now is the, the very edge of the mountains, the very margins of the mountains, and, and what I referred to as Area B before, and I don't have a good name for it yet. But it stands out, um, it's very different than the other parts of Area B for a couple reasons. In this range here, um, we have arable soils, uh, most of the farmland and settlement and roads um, kind of is happening in here in, in modern period. Um, down here we have these um, down-cutting valleys that get kind of rugged as, as all these wadis cut down to the Tigris River. Um, it's a little harder and rougher archaeologically. And, but up here against the mountains, um, it's actually quite distinct. Let's see what the next... Oh, look, it hit me in. So actually for um, what I talk about, we're really going to zoom in on that section here. The current, I'll, I'll, refer it to, I'll refer to it as the current area of interest, for lack of a better catchy name. The reason we're interested in it is it has not been surveyed yet, um, in the, and mostly because it's very difficult to access. Roads don't reach up there. Um, there's not a lot going up there now, because unlike the area just to the south, there's not arable soils right now. Um, but we're finding that it's unexpectedly rich in archaeological features. And that might be a result of preservation from there not being agriculture there. One of, one of the other things that drew our uh, gaze to that area is, I've been, this is a subject of a whole other paper, but I've been running uh, root, mo root models between all the um, sites for different periods just to get a sense of how it would look. And every, every model I ran that would also include um, archaeological, uh, uh, the results of survey in the, in the Chizar region of, of Turkey, and what we could get from Zamar and here in Iraq. Everything, all the routes happen to jump right up here and go along the um, course of the mountains um, for no matter what period, no matter what set of sites I go in. And, and obviously, that's a result of the landscape and the friction surface that's there but maybe there was something to it. So we went ahead and took a little look, and we could see a road um, there that was um, uh, quite tantalizing. And I'll, I'll show it to you in a little bit. Let's see how we advance. Uh -huh. So in 2017, uh, Paolo was able to go out there and begin surveying some of these sites in earnest. Um, first, I want to point out that we do can see a road in corona imagery and modern imagery 
that kind of follows this tract and actually goes on quite far, far down. Maybe it doesn't connect with this one. And so what's very important to us to understand um, first is this just a modern road that uh, happens to um, match up with some sites and be, you know, predicted by those uh, cost surface models. Um, but in fact, it interacts directly with some of these sites. And I'll go backwards in time um, to talk about some of them. We have a uh, town called Zamar, which is an early Islamic town. It's fortified, um, located here up against the margins of the mountains. Um, B232, it needs a better catchier name also, but it is Sasanian and uh, Islamic as well. And Darabun, which has representation um, in later periods, in modern periods of the town. Um, but it also has Middle Bronze evidence and a very conical um, pointy tail that could have, could maybe have a ditch <coughs> around it. So we talked about early Islamic and Sasanian um, tying in with this road, but there also are some MB real tells, only like true tells that are up in this region are at Darabun and then B224. Um, which are both middle bronze, and then there's middle bronze material also associated um, in this region around B232. So we have two kind of major uh, time periods when possibly this road uh, could be fitting. And it should be mentioned that the set key was up and going in the middle bronze too, and wow, could this be a road that connected the set key to Anatolia? That would be an interesting thing to find out. B224. Um, our Middle Bronze Age tell, um, right there, in the middle of the survey area. It's quite cute. Uh, and it's notable not just for being a uh, Middle Bronze uh, tell out up there, you know, all by itself, but this point, you can actually see all the way across. I have to rely on Paula to, to, to verify this, but you can see all the way across to the confluence of the Tigris in the Habor River. And if it is contemporary with Maseki, it marks kind of an interesting defensive position um, to the north. And combine that with the fact that it seems to be surrounded by a ditch um, makes it kind of an interesting thing to, to pursue um, as we go on. B-232, uh, we can see it in various imagery. Um, this is the corona. It always looks so bad when I'm standing next to the slide. I hope this looks better um, for you guys in the back. Looks great on the screen, of course. B232 um, gave us a hint of this road cutting through north of uh, field plots and uh, uh, what are probably um, some um, structures for houses. Uh, we can see it again in the panchromatic uh, digital globe image from 2012, quite clearly. Um, a beautiful road cutting through, not that one, this one cutting through, and it actually incises down into some exposed bedrocks on the edge of the um, valley. I think I have that labeled. There we go. And the B232 boundary um, surrounding it. There's also some, we think, some 20th century pastoralist stuff built on top of that, um, taking advantage of this road. This road, I should also add, we don't get the sense that it's used now. It's quite rugged. There are some new roads popping up in the region, um, but I don't think that this one is actually used um, by vehicles now. So we have the road, B232. We also can pick out some other kind of stone features around Cairns, um, which could be agricultural, could be something else. Um, keep that in mind, because I'll come back to that later. Is the road ancient or modern? Well, we're pretty sure it, it, it's Sasanian at least, because it is tied directly into the architecture um, that is visible on the surface, and that was dated um, with some confidence um, with ceramics. So I've gotten way ahead of my slides here. Cause... So those structures in the road are not the only kind of exposed rock um, features that we're interested in because there's a ton of other land management features that are, that are covering the area. I mentioned those cairns, um, which maybe some of you can see here, but there's also check dams, soil retention features, animal pens, field boundaries, all jammed up against the mountains in this area, once again, in this area with really no arable soil over the bedrock. 
So it, it's kind of an interesting question of what people were doing there. I can zoom in on a couple of these sections and point out um, the field boundaries, these arrangements of stone, many of them quite linear, obviously anthropogenic. Um, these, this is quite tantalizing because uh, we wonder, could it be field clearing or could it be tumuli like our colleagues in the Land of Nineveh project, which is adjacent to us in the east, have um, documented and published. Um, they, I don't know if you guys have excavated them, maybe Marco's in here, but um, they have been looted and they've, they've noted the looting trenches in the past, so we have um, mortuary landscapes combined with these agricultural and pastoralist landscapes way up high. Just another little view of another arrangement of interesting cairns um, that go across the area. So we wanted to get out there with the UAV. Um, we chose the uh, EB with the parrot sequoia. And uh, you can see here that uh, Volker is not the only host at CAA who likes to wear silly hats. Uh, Matthias here has an antenna up, and he organized um, survey plots going across um, the, the survey area, uh, following where we thought the road was, where we could see it in the satellite imagery, also hitting a couple of key sites on the way. I have to say that we were a little bit disappointed with um, the performance of the multispectral camera um, out there in Iraq, so I'm not going to waste your time talking about that, uh, what a multispectral camera can do for you in the blazing midday sun in Iraq. Instead, we'll just look at the DEMs we were able to make um, through a structure from motion uh, using those images. So the DEMs will cover this, uh, what is this, about four kilometer stretch of the road that includes B232 right here. You can actually see the road a little bit in here if you squint. And we threw, you know, the whole works out of it using the, re the Relief Visualization Toolbox, which is a really fantastic tool um, for bringing out uh, surface features, your typical elevation and hill shade, and then the multi-hill shade uh, feature with, which uses uh, hill shaded uh, uh, models, and you combine them like a multi-spectral image, um, and you can see, you know, light bouncing off different sides of the structures. Um, sky view factor is an interesting one. I threw it on there because I'm fascinated by it um, and I don't know how it contributes here. But the simple local relief, which kind of acts like a high pass filter, picking out background variation on a broad scale and highlighting um, uh, local variation is fantastic and really turns the whole area that we've covered with the drone into you know, a pencil drawing um, that we can almost just pop right into uh, plan maps. Um, it brings out very clearly these very subtle fields in addition to the trench of the road, which is kind of like a hollow way and all these other paths. And I should notice, maybe you guys didn't notice this road um, in the, in the um, digital globe image or this stripe here. This area is being developed now. This is the route of an oil pipeline that's going in and with the construction of oil pipelines, uh, lots of guys are coming in with big trucks bulldozing away important archaeological features and cutting up this landscape, which was basically untouched until three years ago. Uh, so that was the contribution from the multispectral camera, which is a multispectral data were not so informative, but we were able to get some good SFN. And if we go back, we're just going to rely directly on the panchromatic camera if we're forced to work in the summer, um, which we probably will be. But I was thinking about, well, how else can we try to approach this stuff? And I remembered that, oh, wait, my digital globe imagery is from April. It's from April of 2012. And so there's some soil moisture to capture and, and some more interesting things going on. And I, and I took another look at it um, and was trying to figure out how can I extract these stone features that comprise the walls and the cairns and the check dams and the field boundaries. And um, decided to look at texture as an index as a way to pick these things out. Um, these cairns and these stone boundaries and all these stone features are, are, are a collection of various materials piled up. So their spectral signature will be mixed with shadow and different types of stone and they probably are retaining soil, so they're supporting vegetation. And so if you wanted to classify that based on their spectral signature, you'd have a pretty hard time. But if you look for things that are mixed, 
then maybe we can um, highlight them in a little better way. So I ran, oh, so I ran a texture analysis just in a seven pixel wind window. This is a um, half meter panchromatic image. So the seven pixels represents um, uh, three and a half meters, which is, you know, you want your window to be a little bit bigger than your features that you're looking for. If you make it too narrow, you don't get a good picture. And I basically did a texture analysis. So now the high values represent areas where there's lots of vari variability in that seven pixel window. And the dark areas is where things are quite homogeneous, right? And you can see the walls start to come out. But also is what's coming out is all these damn bushes and trees, which are flourishing in April. And um, uh, yeah, and in the bodies too, and things like that. And so I thought I'd try to suppress those. And I looked at the NDVI um, to you know, highlight surface vegetation and see how it contributes to the overall variability represented in that texture model. You guys know what NDVI is, most of you. Um, it's an index of uh, leaf richness. And you can see these green places where it's really leafy and green. We got grass, pastures, and little trees bopping around. And then we have um, basically exposed soil in other ways. And I opted to not kind of take a harsh classification, like a boolean uh, subtraction of where things are quite leafy um, and take it out of the texture. But instead, I um, decided to try PCA of the two. Oh, why does that? OK. PCA of these two to gently suppress the, end, the vegetation contribution to texture. Um, and to do that, right, you do PCA on two images. You get two um, images out. The first um, component will be a sum of the shared variability in, run by the principal components analysis. And the second image you will get out are things that they do not share. And the texture and NDVI kind of have an inverse relationship in these two, so when you put them both together, you get something back um, where the, the vegetation, uh, I can't see it very well, the vegetation um, appears as white and kind of blends in the background, and the, the texture features um, are left to be highlighted and not masked by the, by the variance introduced by the high textures of the vegetation. So I feel like that this is a great improvement, actually, on even the DEMs that we were able to generate using the drone um, earlier on. I mean, not only can you see um, more field boundaries and walls going up, um, up the slope, but we can pick out uh, these cairns quite clearly, some other ones that I wasn't quite aware of. Um, there's these things which Paula said she went and checked them out, and we were wondering if it was a Connaught, but we we're not really sure, but she's shaking her head. Anyway, it came out really nicely. One of the things that still um, was troubling me a little bit was you can see the wash, right, of, of this, this... Now I'm confused, so I'm gonna skip ahead. You can see the wash of the, of the highly vegetated areas against where stone was exposed on the surface. So I went back to that local relief model again to, to kind of suppress uh, broad scale variation and emphasize, it's a, it's a high pass filter, and emphasize local variation. And I think it improves it a little bit in picking out the stone walls even better. I was joking earlier that I, I tried to make this satellite imagery look like a magnetometry picture in the end, uh, which, which I feel like it kind of does now. Like, I like magnetometry. Let's look at Zafaran as well. Remember, Zafaran is our early Islamic. Am I going too long? Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh. oh, I have like an hour. Then. <laughs> Let's look at Zafaran, uh, Islamic uh, village, again, way to the east. It's fortified. This is your digital globe image. Um, and you can pick out uh, fortifications going all around here. I think it's hard for me to see. Um, check out the scale, it's pretty big, eh? We have some field systems going up into uh, the, the hills, but obviously this is actually much more obscured by the local vegetation than B232. 
but we can run these systems, uh, this, this texture analysis, and look at the second component of uh, PCA of texture analysis against the NDVI, where it suppresses uh, all the vegetation, and all of a sudden some smaller walls are starting to pop out um, in the core of Zafaran. We can see these field boundaries cutting all the way up under the bushes, um, up these wadis, catching soil, holding back moisture in past um, for the um, early Islamic residents of Zafaran. We can do the, um, this is a little garish maybe, but we could do the, the, um, the local relief model um, and uh, pick it out, pick out these walls even better. And this leads us to probably what would be the next step is extracting all these automatically for field survey. So that so there's some there's still some other problems to go. I should I should mention this. Um, we will go back and we will classify these landforms a little better. We're up against the mountain slope, like the harsh mountain slope. This is a steep climb right here where it's clearly exposed rock and any kind of soil is limited to tiny little pockets um, above here. You can't I cut it off because it's not worth looking at if you're interested in archaeology. So we need to filter out these areas where the folding of the, of the rocks and the mountains is contributing to our, our mapping, basically. Um, it's, it's obscuring, you know, by looking at all this clutter, you're not drawn to the important stuff, which is the field boundaries and things like that. So that's one thing we need to do, is mask those out. Um, but what we have in the end is um, something that we can turn into vectors and put on a tablet in mobile GIS and in the coming years Pala and the field survey team can go out and individually select these in the field, um, make, make notes about them directly um, and verify them. And then we have to be very careful because um, we now have, I don't know, dozens of square kilometers of stone features mapped by this, by this method um, and we need to develop a good sampling strategy to try to assign date, age, use, um, any kind of interpretive uh, stuff to them in large groups. So that's our next step, and I'll leave that kind of open-ended for that, um, and I'm happy to hear any suggestions or comments or questions you guys might have. Thank you very much.